Father, open our eyes that we would see glimpses of truth that you have for us in your word. Show us Christ as we open the pages of your sacred book. Father, guard my tongue, speak through me. May your spirit work in our hearts today for our good and for your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, and open to Joshua 7 as we begin this morning. You heard Pastor Tim mention next week we will be outside altogether. That service will be at 1030. So looking forward to having the church family together next week. The following week, September 13th, I'm going to do kind of a special message. How do we live with joy in these days? I read somebody recently who said, there's an assault on joy right now, an assault on joy. Well, well said. And yet we are called as believers to rejoice always. How do we do that? So we're going to talk about that on uh, the 17th or the 13th, excuse me. And then on the 20th, back to the gospel of John. We left off in chapter eight, way back in March. And so we'll need to catch up a little bit, and then we'll begin back in the Gospel of John. But today we're going to conclude our study of the Ten Commandments. And personally, I have found this study to be very helpful for me. It's been both encouraging, challenging, and convicting. Seeing more fully and understanding more richly the law of God has made me all the more appreciative for the grace of God. As I understand the law of God, I'm so appreciative of the grace of God. You'll remember that we said at the beginning of this study that God does not give his law to his people in order for that to be the mechanism of their salvation. He had already redeemed them when he gave them the law. With God, grace precedes law. Law doesn't get one to God. God actually gets one to God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw this in our study. We looked at Exodus 19. Before the law is given, in Exodus 19, God says to Moses, I brought these people out of Egypt. I bore them up on eagles' wings and brought them to myself. And now, If they will obey my statutes, obey my law, they will be my people. So now, by having been brought to God through grace and mercy, God gives his law now. And God's law is never given as a way to oppress, as a way to make life more difficult, but as a way to freedom and joy. And we've seen that the Ten Commandments can be broken into two pieces, two tables, if you will. And the the first table relates to one's relationship with God. It is the, the vertical. Jesus said it's how one loves God. You shall have no other God. You shall have no graven image. You hallow his name by not taking it in vain. And you worship him and rest on the Lord's day. That's the first table of the law. Then the second table of the law is how we interact with each other, the horizontal, how we love our neighbor, Jesus said. And all that began in the home by children obeying their parents. You don't murder, commit adultery, or steal, or lie. And so now we come to the final commandment, commandment number 10. And to set up that final commandment, I want us to look at Joshua chapter 7. Now, between Exodus 20 And Joshua chapter 7, a lot happens in the history of the nation of Israel. The golden calf happens. The tabernacle is built and worship begins. Moses strikes the rock. Water comes from the rock. Uh, They make their way to the edge of the promised land. All of that happens between Exodus chapter 12 and Joshua chapter 7. You remember that the nation gets to the edge of the promised land and the spies are sent into the land by Moses. Twelve spies go in and ten spies come back and say, this is not good. There is giants in the land and they actually say, we would have been better off to stay in Egypt. It's hard to believe they say it. They doubt God's ability to lead them into the promised land and conquer the giants of the land. So God condemns them. That whole generation is condemned. And for 40 years, they wander and wait 
in the wilderness. At the end of that 40 years, Moses dies, and Joshua then leads them into the promised land. And the first city they come to is Jericho, the very first city. And they come to Jericho, and God instructs them to destroy the city, but to do it in such a way that only God could receive glory for how the city is destroyed. Not a single weapon would be used. The tactic for destroying Jericho would be to walk around the city, and that's it. God showing his people that I will lead you into the land. So they walk around day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And then on the seventh day, they walk around the city seven times and the walls come down. And clear instructions were given that when the walls come down, go into the city and all of the possessions of Jericho are to be given to the treasury of the Lord. Almost as if it was a first fruits offering, the, fir the first city that they conquer. And all that is found in that city goes into the treasury of the Lord. No one takes anything for themselves. And all seems to go as planned. Jericho is conquered. The next city after Jericho is Ai. Ai is a much smaller city, much less great in size. And so with the confidence that Israel has gained from conquering Jericho, they say, we don't even need to send the whole army. They send 3,000 soldiers. And those 3,000 soldiers go to Ai, and they are roundly defeated. In fact, 36 of them are killed. Joshua tears his clothes and mourning and in disbelief and cries out to God, why would you let this happen? How could we be defeated like this? And in Joshua chapter 7, we see God's answer to Joshua. Look at verse 11. Israel has sinned. They've transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have broken some of the devoted, they have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. But you read that verse and you see a couple of the Ten Commandments that had been broken, don't you? There was stealing. There was lying. And because of it, the entire nation suffered. Now, if you read on in chapter 7, you see that through a process, it's revealed who the lawbreaker is. First, the tribe that they're from is identified, then the clan, then the family, and then the man, Achan. Achan was the man. And there he stands in verse 18, identified by God as the lawbreaker. Joshua calmly approaches Achan and says in verse 19, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Don't hide it from me. And notice carefully Achan's response to Joshua. Verse 20, truly I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel. This is what I did. When I saw the spoil, a beautiful cloak from Shinar, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they're hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. Did you notice a sequence in that verse? There was a sequence that Achan reveals that he himself went through. First, he saw. He saw. Now, it's not always wrong to see. It's not wrong to see. Seeing the cloak, seeing the silver, seeing the gold, that's not where Achan sinned. In fact, the nation was supposed to see those things, and take them into the treasury of the Lord. So it wasn't seeing it that was the problem. It's what happened after that first look in the mind of Achan that was the problem. We know this by the word he uses to describe what he saw. He looked at the cloak and the silver and the gold, and you notice what Achan called them? Spoils. These are the spoils now, spoils are what victorious soldiers take from those they defeated. God never called what was left in Jericho after the walls came down spoils. God called it holy unto him. Achan called them spoils. Achan saw the cloak, the silver, and the gold differently 
than God saw them. He saw them as spoils that were his. God saw them as holy unto himself, a first fruits offering. And this is where his problem began. He saw, and then in verse 21, it says he coveted, he desired it. He, he wanted it, and so he took it. His coveting brought about the breaking of multiple commands. And I would argue he broke commandments in both the first table of the law and the second table of the law by his actions. If you read on, the items were discovered in Achan's tent, and he and his entire family were put to death because of his evil. And at the core of it for Achan was that he coveted. He coveted. Turn to Exodus chapter 20 where we find the final commandment of the Decalogue. We have worked our way through each one, studying them. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, as many years before Achan, the nation is gathered around Sinai, God gives them the final commandment in verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his, or his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, let me just be honest. In, in my mind, when I read through the Ten Commandments and I, and I get to the last one, it feels a bit anticlimactic. I mean, some of the preceding commandments seem much juicier, much more dangerous, much more devastating. Murder, stealing, adultery, and lying seem much more harmful than coveting. And indeed, there is a difference between murder and adultery and lying and coveting. I think the difference is obvious. Coveting is something that happens inside. It's internal. It takes place in our hearts, in our minds. The others happen externally. I think this is why coveting is the final commandment. It's the internal core of the second table of the law. It's what leads to breaking all of the other commandments. We saw it with Achan. Lying and stealing followed his coveting. James in the New Testament says exactly the same thing. James chapter 4 verse 2 says, You desire and do not have, so you murder. He repeats almost the same thought. You covet and cannot con obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Desiring, coveting is where it all begins. And the actions follow the sin of coveting that takes place in the heart. I think commandment one, have no other gods, and commandment 10, don't covet it, serve as the bookends of the law each representing or summarizing the table of the law that they are part of. So I think that's why the final command is, you shall not covet. Now let's look at the command specifically, how it's, how it's worded. There's a couple things for us to note. First of all, note, it's the only commandment with a double negation. You shall not covet is stated twice. Twice, the only commandment that is like that. And this repetition is for emphasis. It, it's a big deal. And then you notice this breadth of examples. Don't covet your neighbor's house or wife, his servants, his animals. And then it ends with this kind of loophole closing statement. Nothing that he has do you covet. Nothing. So it gives a list, a broad list, and then says nothing. It's meant to be all-encompassing whether it's material, animal, human, anything, don't covet, don't desire or want what your neighbor has. Now, the word covet is not one that we really use kind of in our everyday vernacular. I don't know when the last time was that I used the word covet in ordinary conversation. I don't know that I ever have. It's not a word that we use commonly. And when you look at the word as we find it here in the text, there's nothing in and of itself that makes it a bad word. It could be translated desire, desire. But, but not all desires are bad, are they? 
Kevin DeYoung, in his commentary on this, listed a number of desires that we find in Scripture that are good. Sarah and Hannah desired children. In the Song of Solomon, we read that there's an appropriate desire of intimacy among spouses. Proverbs encourages hard work and diligence for those rightly desiring domestic or financial advancement. The early church desired the Spirit of God to come and work powerfully among the early church. Goodness, even Paul desired to be with God, which was far better. So not all desire is bad, but that's not the type of desire that the 10th commandment is describing. There's a dark side to desire, a dark side. Phil Riken said it this way, it's not simply wanting something you don't have, it's wanting something somebody else has. That's what coveting is. That's the desire that's being talked about here. Achan wanted what was God's. David wanted what was Uriah's. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Ahab. He wanted the vineyard next door. He wanted Naboth's vineyard. Part of what makes coveting so bad is how it distorts relationships that God intends to exist among his people. Instead of being happy for your neighbor, you, you want what they have. And that can't help but sour the relationship because you're focused on what they have that you want. The whole time you're at your neighbor's house and they intend for you to just be enjoying a barbecue, you're staring at their stuff and desiring it. And it distorts the relationship that God intended. Jealousy ensues. And the purity of a healthy relationship is lost. One author referenced a Greek fable, that, and I had never heard this fable before. There existed a covetous man, and the gods came to him and granted him any wish he liked on the condition that whatever he wished for, his neighbor got double. Well, he didn't know what to do with that. So here's what he wished for. I wish to lose one eye. Yeah, it's terrible. But that's what coveting does. Coveting is the internal poison of the mind and heart that when allowed to grow, results in destroyed relationships and the breaking of the other commandments. That's why it's at the end. It's a very significant commandment. So what is the antidote for this poison of coveting? How do we keep from desiring our neighbor's house and our neighbor's spouse and their stuff and walking down that destructive path of coveting that leads to the breaking of even more of the commandments? What's the antidote? One word. Write it down. Contentment. Contentment is the antidote to coveting. So we're going to take a test this morning. You see these on the internet all the time. You know, take a test to see what Disney character you are. (laughs) I saw a test the other day. Take a test to see if you truly are a Michigander. You know, do you use your hand as a map? Do you call it pop instead of soda? Do you know how to pronounce Charlevoix, Sault Ste. Marie, Mackinac, Kalamazoo? I mean, these are tests to know whether or not you're really from Michigan. Here, let, let me give you a contentment test, a commitment test. Have you ever had a thought that started with these words? If only. If only. If only I worked there. If only I worked here. If only my husband was more like him or my wife was more like her. If only we had a house like theirs. If only I made what he does or she does. If we're really honest with ourselves, contentment is a struggle for all of us. It's a struggle for all of us. Even beyond wanting what others have, we just find this struggle. I, I, when it's spring, you know what I want? Summer. 
When it's summer, I want fall. When it's fall, I want winter. And when it's winter, I want spring. Old people want to be young, and young people want to be old. It just doesn't seem to matter. There's always this either low-grade or sometimes high-grade discontentment that is always going on in our lives. There just seems to always be dissatisfaction. And the truth is, brethren, there is nothing in this earth that you will find, either possession or situation, that will fully satisfy you. Nothing will. Nothing will. Nelson Rockefeller, grandson of John D. Rockefeller, Standard Oil, you know, the, the billionaire. Somebody asked Nelson Rockefeller, how much more money does it take to be happy? And he famously said, just a little bit more. Nothing will ever satisfy. It's hard to be content. It's almost easier to keep the other commandments because they're external. They're things we can just stop doing. But this is our heart that's being talked about here. I think this makes it one of the more difficult of the commandments to actually keep. And there's one passage that I'd like us to look at for a moment that speaks to this idea of contentment that we've got to get our arms around. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy 6, Paul is speaking to the Ephesian church and he is warning them against false teachers. False teachers had come into the church at Ephesus and they were not just teaching false truths, but their motive for teaching false truth was gain. They wanted to gain an audience and they wanted to gain the offerings that came from that audience. It was all about money. They wanted more money. And so Paul is writing to Timothy to warn them against the false teachers. 1 Timothy 6, verse 3. If anyone teaches a different doctrine that does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit. He understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels without words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and, con and, con and constant friction among people who are of depraved mind, and depraved of truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. There's a warning about those false teachers that are doing what they're doing in order for gain, financial gain. And Paul is going to write and say, that's not the gain you ought to be after. There is a better gain, and he says it in verse 6. Godliness with contentment is what is of great gain. Not financial gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul actually keeps the word gain. He just spins it and uses it in a different way. When godliness and contentment are married in the heart of the child of God, there is a gain like no other. A gain like no other. And then Paul spends verses 7 and 8 talking about contentment. And he breaks it down into two simple statements. Verses 7 and 8. We brought nothing into the world, and we can't take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. You, you brought nothing in and you take nothing out. What does that mean? That means there's really nothing here that you need. You didn't bring anything in with you. You're not leaving with anything. So ultimately, there is nothing here that you need. In fact, I would argue our greatest need is outside the world, not in the world. The greatest need is outside, not inside. If you've read Ecclesiastes, you know that Solomon had the resources and he pursued every available pleasure that earth had to offer. Everything. He gives a whole catalog in chapter 2. He says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. I tried it all everything the world has to offer. 
And he concludes by saying everything was meaningless. It's like chase it after the wind, he says. That's how meaningless it was. It was like chasing after the wind. Nothing here in this world will ultimately satisfy. So whatever you see that your neighbor has, that you think, if only I had that, then I would be happy. You are dead wrong. You're dead wrong. You won't be happy. You'll get that, and then you'll want something else. And after that, you'll want something else. Rockefeller was right. Just want a little more. A little more, a little more. True satisfaction, true contentment is sourced outside the world, not in it. And we know, brethren, where it's sourced outside the world. It's all points to Christ. Nothing in this world will give us what we truly want. Only Christ. Only in Christ is there true satisfaction. Only in Christ is there forgiveness. Only in Christ is there redemption. Only in Christ is there peace. Only in Christ is there salvation. Only in Christ is there joy. Only in Christ is there new life. Only in Christ is there eternal life. This was the travesty of the false teachers that Paul is writing to warn about. They're leading you in the wrong direction. They're leading you away from Christ who is the only source of true satisfaction. Our greatest need is outside the world, not in it. Nothing here will satisfy. Nothing. Second thing Paul wrote, after we brought nothing in, we can't take anything out. If you've got food and clothing, we are to be content. Outside the world comes our greatest need. Here in the world, it seems that all we need is the basics, the necessities. And Paul lists them. If you've got food and clothes to wear and a place to stay, the word used for clothing there means covering or, or shelter, those basic necessities. If you've got those, you should be content. Now, is contentment a call to live at the most basic level? Maybe. Maybe. Paul actually addresses this, I think, in Philippians 4. He says, I've learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. Whether God has blessed you with much or blessed you with not so much. If whatever you have provides for your basic needs, you be content with that. Whether it's much or whether it's little, because apparently there were circumstances in Paul's life where he had much, and in other circumstances where he had little. I've learned, Paul says, the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, not in the abundance of stuff or the lack of stuff. Remember, the true satisfaction comes from outside, not inside. Paul had occasions of much or little, but since his greatest need had been met in Christ, circumstances didn't matter, whether it was lean or whether it was good. But notice the word that Paul used. I have learned, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He had to learn it. That tells me that it didn't come right away. He didn't have it initially. Learning contentment is hard. It's hard to be content. It's hard to not covet. I mean, we look around where we live. We live, brethren, in an area of plenty. I believe this is still the case. Oakland County is the most wealthy county in the state of Michigan. There's a lot around here. My neighbors have a lot of stuff. They both have better lawnmowers than I do. <laughs> I look out there and I see that and think, my lawn could look so much better. How do we learn contentment? It's, it's hard. I found a helpful statement from Sinclair Ferguson on this. He said, if contentment could be produced by programmed means, like a five-step, if you could get contentment through a five-step program, it would be commonplace. It would be commonplace if there was just five steps to follow. Instead, Christians must discover contentment the old-fashioned way. We must learn it. Thus, we cannot do contentment. It's taught by God. 
We're schooled in it. It's part of the process of being transformed through the renewing of our minds, Romans 12. It is commanded of us, but paradoxically, it's also done to us, not by us. It's not a product of a series of actions, but of renewed and transformed character. Only good trees produce good fruit, and here's the crux of the matter. How do you learn to be content? We must enroll in the divine school in which we are instructed by biblical teaching and providential experience. God's got to do it in us. We can't do it on our own. And so when we struggle with contentment, we must cry out to God, change my heart, oh God. Renew the right spirit within me. I'm after the wrong things. This is a work of the heart. And that's where God works. And he works very effectively with the scalpel of the word of God that pierces down through the joints and marrow to do his work. God is our hope when it comes to not coveting and being content. Alistair Begg quoted one woman who said, years ago, I stopped looking for anyone but God to satisfy me. There's no man that could love me enough, no child that could need me enough, no job that could pay enough, no experience that could satisfy me enough. Only Jesus. Nothing here satisfies. Only that which comes from outside is Jesus. And you know, this is what the law, this is what the Ten Commandments does. It points us to Jesus. I mean, as, as we have looked at these commandments, we have, we have certainly seen that they help us to know how to live. It's part of the reason we have the Ten Commandments. They help us to know how to live and how to live a life that will bring peace and joy. But that is not the law's only purpose. Turn finally this morning to Romans chapter 7, if you would. Romans chapter 7. Paul here gives a testimony of what the Tenth Commandment did in his life. Romans chapter 7. Go down to verse 7. Paul writes, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin Seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. What, what's Paul saying there? Before I read the law, I didn't even know I coveted. I didn't even know it. I didn't even realize it. But then I read the law of God and I realized my life is chock full of coveting. He says, sin came alive to me through the law. He saw his sin. Brethren, that's what the law does. The law shows us that you and I are completely incapable of keeping the law. You can't keep it. You can't go a day without coveting. I can't go a day without coveting. And we see that we are lawbreakers. That's what Paul's testimony is. The law shows us our sin. It shows us that we can't keep God's righteous standard and that we are all condemned as lawbreakers. But from outside the world, from heaven, came one who knew no sin came one who broke no law, who lived as a man, and yet was put to death as though he had broken every law multiple times. Because he went to the cross for every time. You broke the law, and you broke the law, and you broke the law, and I broke the law. And he went to the cross, and he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we're healed. What the law does is it shines a spotlight on our only hope, Jesus Christ. So I hope that as we have looked at the law of God, you have seen this. This is how we live. But I hope more importantly, you have seen, you have broken the law again and again and again. And yet, in Christ, you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified by the one who kept the law and was punished as a lawbreaker, the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we sang at the beginning, turn our eyes upon Jesus. Look full at his wonderful face. Father, as we have looked at the law of God, we have seen our failures afresh, and it causes us to rejoice in the work of Jesus Christ and all that we have in him. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts to produce a contentment, a godly contentment that keeps us from coveting our neighbor's stuff. God, help us in this way, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.